I don't know how to feed the Tamagotchi. Is it like left, right, start, or? Hey everybody, what's up? It's me, Da Purple Sharpie, here with yet another fantastic game development interview here at This Game Does With Color Expo 2021. I am here with fantastic developer, Sean Dean, amazing art director for Button City. Sean Dean, thank you so much for having me today. Hi, thanks for having me here. I'm excited. I am too! Oh my gosh! <laughs> Twinsies! All right, tell me a little bit more about Button City. All right, so Button City is a low-poly narrative, narrative adventure. You play as a young fox named Fennel. Um, he just discovers the local arcade, and there he starts making friendships, playing games, and very quickly you start realizing that somebody's trying to shut down the arcade, and they're trying to take it all away. Uh, so it's going through this little adventure, having fun, and living out your 90s summer dream. I love that so much for them. It's such a beautiful game, honestly, and let's talk about that. So Fennel has just moved to this brand new city, found this brand new arcade, and has run into a quite boisterous group of people. But before that, the game opens, and like you said, is very 90s. They have a theme song, the game literally opens on Fennel, playing on a Game Boy, attacking the final boss, and even the interactive menu, PetBot, is very 90s reminiscent. I mean, look at them, they're a Tamagotchi. Mm -hmm. Was all of that intentional? It was very intentional. Um, I was inspired by Tamagotchis when I was designing the PetBot. Um, and drawing from just like tons of um, like kid culture and 90s electronics toys. I even have a like a poochie hidden out in the world. Um, and I, I created a mood board of just all of these cute little toys, very colorful. I pulled a lot of the colors um, from the toys and the palettes. And we just wanted to bring in all of these little joys that, um, that we experienced as kids and kind of put them in a new light, um, reinvent them and kind of develop them into the world because you're you're playing as animals. Mm -hmm. So uh, we wanted them to have a lot of like technology and instead of having pets, they have like um, little toy robots to play with. So we kind of wanted to weave that into the world. Now, I know that they're not humans. I know that they're animals, but they have very human characteristics. For example, Fennel is a very timid fox. They have a difficult time standing up for themselves when confronted, as we see with bullies and as we see when they're trying to defend themselves against some some talking inside of the sh inside of the game. Uh, the '90s era, we saw a lot of protagonists with very robust and very external, uh, strong personality traits. Talk to me about the development for Fennel's personality, which seems to be the opposite of that. Yeah, so Fennel is very much kind of inspired by um, uh, your typical Zelda type character like Link. Um, Link is very quiet, but we did want to layer on a personality for Fennel. Uh, so we wanted to kind of give him an observational perspective in the world where he's kind of observing a story that's happening um, happening around and to him. I think Sorrel would be like, kind of like that typical 90s main character yes. vibe. And we very much wanted Fennel to kind of like pal around with Sorrel and follow around um, with her and her gang. That that was very that was very eye opening to me. The uh, very first interaction, no spoils whatsoever, with Sorrel and Fennel is very much so. She's definitely out there, like staking her turf, you know, protecting people that come into her turf, and it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, while we're talking about Sorrel, let's talk about the Fluff Squad because they are a part of the main characters here. We have Sorrel, mm -hmm. obviously the cat, Lavender, the panda, and we have Chive, the robot all on the Gobobots team that are all working together. Talk me about the inspiration behind each of them. 
Yeah, so we were very inspired by kind of like the your typical like 90s kid gang. And we really wanted to have this kind of like dynamics of different personalities um, that would feed off of each other. And we developed them in a way that um, so that they would have these like really genuine fun interactions. Um, like Lavender, she's very artistic. She's quiet, um, very responsible. And you get her paired with like someone like Sorrel who's boisterous and overexcitable and she gets really angry and you kind of get these like um, interactions where Lavender very much tempers the group. Um, and then Chive, she's a little abrasive uh, and she feeds off of like Sorrel's energy a lot and they make plans that would never work. Um, and Lavender always thinks that Chive is really irresponsible. So we planned it out so that they would very much um, kind of have a, uh, just like feed off of each other and get into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounds like a very fantastic, I would say definitely kind of like codependent relationship, mm -hmm. which I think always works very well from a narrative point of view. And just all their personality traits sound very engaging to me. And they definitely came through inside of a lot of the narrative aspects. Uh, speaking of some of their personality traits, Chive, really stood out to me as a character, all right? They're kind of like a non-enthusiastic person, kind of sarcastic. Mm -hmm. And and to be very frank with you, they seem less enthused around people specifically who don't play video games is what I get a lot from them. Now, inside of the gaming community, we have people like that as well, and they're typically called gatekeepers. Talk to me about why you opted to make Chive this character and also why you felt like it was important to call homage to it inside of the main character. Mm-hmm. So Chime is an interesting character. She's um, we wanted somebody that would be very skeptical, skeptical of Fennel when he first joins the group, but who would warm up to him. Um, Chive is kind of like a tough nut to crack. Yeah. And once once she really gets to know someone and accepts them, she's incredibly loyal and will stick up for them. So we really wanted this person to kind of look at the main character and kind of be like, oh, you, you don't know how to play this game yet. Obviously the person playing doesn't know how to play yet either. So you kind of have to warm up and, um, earn your spot in the group a little bit. And we did we, we did want to kind of highlight some of those different personalities that you stumble upon in gaming communities. But um, but Chai is a really great character. Once you get to know her, she's amazing. She she seemed like the type. I didn't want to mm -hmm. assume, like I said, <laughs> I did only play the demo full disclosure. Like I haven't completed mm -hmm. the game, obviously. But it did, it did give me the vibes of like, you know, this character will probably warm up to me a little bit later inside of the story. Mm -hmm. I, I really like the way that you all coded her as well. I felt like it was very true to the nature of that type of person inside of the gaming community, which brings me on to my next question here. Like some of the conversations that you have with people, not just uh, the main characters, but around the world, the NPCs, a lot of the, a lot of the conversations, a lot of the speech patterns, uh, even the inflictions inside of the sentence are very similar to things that I encounter when I actually go to offline competitive events. And I do go to quite a, a, a few, all right? I am a professional video gamer. So I wanted to know, where did you all get inspiration for that in that writing style? I know a few members on your team actually happen to be going to offline events themselves, specifically uh, RVA Game Jams in Richmond, Virginia, as well as Albuquerque Game Development Guilds in, um, um, in Albuquerque, <laughs> New Mexico. Can you talk to me about either one of these locations and where they yeah. got inspiration from? So um, three members of our team, uh, we volunteer and help run the Albuquerque Game Developers Guild. Um, my husband and I helped found it. And we spent a lot of time and energy into um, boistering up our communities, um, both for game makers and people who play games. Um, on the side of the Game Developers Guild, we would also go to local Splatoon tournaments. That's where we got a lot of inspiration for um, like the GobaBots game and a lot of people who would come and meet up and um, play together and get really competitive. We always wanted like uh, to have rivals. <laughs> so that's something we wanted to write into the game too, as well as um, arcade culture. There's an arcade that my husband and I go to all the time um, and just observing and being part of those communities. Uh, we wanted to write that in and kind of get that like, get that feel of like you're actually going to arcade with people playing and people who are really like obsessed with these games and they love them. 
Well, you know what they say, write about what you know. And I think mm -hmm. you did a fantastic job capturing the essence of these players inside of this game to the point that I literally felt like, I'll be very honest with our viewers and listeners right now, there is a local event that I'm not going to right now to be here. And I genuinely felt like I was at that local event playing this game. It was very astounding. <laughs> you did a fantastic job with that. I'm glad that came across. Community is a huge part of the game. That's something we really wanted to have reflected. Were there any other aspects where you felt like you showcased community as well inside of the game? Yeah. Um, so I don't want to get too deep into spoilers, but um, like the arcade is getting bought out and closing and you know, you're trying to figure out why. And you're starting to also realize that there's a deeper connected community around the arcade who love it. Um, Mr. Button, the character who runs the arcade. Um, and you're just, you're, you're kind of seeing like um, the world and how everyone loves and supports it. So that's, that's a huge part, because if the arcade left, the community would leave inside the game. Um, and it's about preserving the community as well as uh, saving the arcade. Now, that's a really interesting aspect. And I know we didn't talk about this too much before the interview. But I am curious. Um, I know that many offline events nowadays are struggling, not only from the quarantine and uh, the, the fact that we weren't able to have offline events. But even prior to that, we saw a lot of offline events disappearing. Um, and a lot of gaming culture starting to kind of leave in the wake of like online events and, and larger esports that are that aren't as prevalent any longer. Was a lot of the basis for the story based around that? Did you grab that for inspiration? So most of the story was pretty much already written before um, COVID started happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's a good. That's a good answer. No spoilers. No spoilers. Okay. No spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's move on to the actual gameplay and some of the mechanics that we see inside of the game. Let's start with the fact that you can interact with anything and everything that the light touches, all right? And that must have been so difficult to design. How important to the game is allowing the player to interact and explore with their surroundings? That was pretty important for us um, as a kind of like an aesthetic choice too, because um, we thought of the world as a bit of like a toy box in the way it looks and it's designed kind of like in the dioramas, like a little poly pocket to get back to 90s stuff. And um, everything is very toy like. So we wanted to make sure you could go poke around and look at everything um, and interact with everything. So we did put a lot of time into that. We would have to put on little animation, sound effects, little quips from Fennel. Um, and we did like a full sweep of the world going through, okay, we need that, that, and that, and that. And, that. Um, and at the end of development, we were just running down this list, trying to add in everything. <laughs> I love that so mm -hmm. much, that idea of like, what do we keep? What do we keep? What do we keep? You know, and <laughs> yeah. I have to imagine, especially when you're designing a low poly game, you have to be very, very, very uh, focused on what the intention behind every single item inside of the game is as well. Is that correct? Yeah, um, I developed a lot of the like the levels and the artwork kind of as a whole. So um, like Fennel's bedroom, um, I would model it all with like all the stuff all together rather than like making individual elements and then putting them together afterwards. Mm. So it was kind of like um, you have to get like a rhythm since everything is so simple and flat. Um, I needed a lot of little things to put together to kind of make a visual rhythm and to make each area very interesting and engaging. So I'd actually like to talk about another area. I know you just said here that basically when you're designing the rooms, instead of dividing them as individual items, you basically design the entirety of it together, which kind of actually helps inside of the game because when you move into different areas, when you move into even a different room inside of the same area, you do feel that very nice cohesion inside of the room. And to this, I wanna actually bring it over to the arcade because the arcade is one of the very first times that you actually move into an area with a significant up uh, amount of different NPCs. And you're kind of like left with this like wonderful moment of seeing so many vivid and very, very distinct different uh, NPC characters, as well as a very solid background. Talk to me about what that was like designing that specific area. So obviously we really wanted the arcade to be something special and very fun. Um, the arcade had a few different iterations. Um, I think it to be just right. machine, the <laughs> snack bar, um, making the claw machines and 
finding like some arcade machines. So we would have like the retro machines, the things that don't actually have like a um, uh, an arcade mini game attached to them. And then you would have like the big special flashy machines. Um, and I would like reference like real kind of like 2000s era modern arcade <laughs> machines like um, like DDR or like some of the racing. And those were incredibly fun to put together. It was also kind of like designing a toy as well because they're so simple and colorful. So obviously there are multiple, multiple amazing arcades that you could have called reference from. And I know previously you said that uh, you worked with another person specifically on uh, the Game Developer Guild in Albuquerque. Now I'm interested to know if that also did inspire a lot of what we saw here. Like you said previously, you gathered inspiration from uh, the people who actually went to Splatoon events, specifically for how to code and how to narrate some of the characters. Did you also gather inspiration from local arcades around the area? And could you name a couple of them? Yeah. Um, so we have an arcade um, in our city called Nickel City, which very much inspired the name <laughs> of the game. Um, and that was kind of, that, that place has been around forever. Um, and that kind of like inspired the um, just like this old rundown kind of like arcade still surviving and um, round one opened pretty recently. And that's where like we play all of our games. Um, like my husband, he plays this game called Maximum Tune. It's like a drift racing game. And that inspired um, Revolution Racer in the game. And that's why we put that in there. Mm, um, and then that. I play rhythm games. Um, the game I play, it didn't really inspire um, uh, Prisma Beats, but there's a huge community for DDR mm -hmm. that we really drew on and we wanted to kind of feel like, it, it's like a cross because like the characters in the game, they're playing with the pad, like they're dancing, but yeah. the player who's playing the game, like they're hitting the buttons. Yeah. Uh, so there's a little disconnect from that, but we wanted to represent the games that we really enjoyed and the, um, the themes of those. Some of the movement inside of Button City relies very heavily on the zooming mechanic, which allows you to very easily traverse inside of a small space. Why did you decide to design this feature for movement specifically inside of the game? So this is a very interesting little mechanic. Um, and it kind of came about because this was a very um, art driven game. Mm -hmm. And when Bun City was first conceived, it was just me. I was learning how to 3D model and I had made a little diorama um, with a little fox. So it was like him in his house. And we still use that same model in the game. Um, and at first, like we wanted to maybe make it a tiny little game. Maybe you're just like on the diorama. And we quickly realized like we wanted to go full force and make this an entire, entire world, a larger game. And kind of came up to this problem of how do we expand this? Because we love that diorama look. Um, mm -hmm. And I liked the feeling of everything being like a little toy box. Um, and it was very novel and we enjoyed that. So uh, we were, it was that zooming mechanic came out of uh, problem solving and how to preserve um, that little diorama feel. And like, there were a few ideas. One was um, like little elevators or a balloon or like the cube could turn um, in some way. And this kind of, this was just like one of the ideas that stuck and we're like, oh, this is brilliant. This works perfectly. It really does allow the game to kind of stand alone while still giving the player uh, the ability to like choose where they want to move to next and whether or not they'd like to move and progress in the story. I like that a mm -hmm. lot because it does still uh, keep the sense of choice and onus on the player while not forcing them and to overload when they go into the overworld, which I just have to say I really love. <laughs> My final question is, Obviously, this game is out literally right now. It is available on Steam, and if you, for whatever reason, cannot immediately get it, wishlisting it literally right now is the best thing you can do. But I understand that it is also available for next generation consoles as well. Is that correct? Yeah. So it's on PlayStation 5, um, Xbox Series, and Nintendo Switch. Oh, that's fantastic. I mm -hmm. have to get it for my Nintendo Switch. This is a great game mm -hmm. that you can just pick up and play on the go. I love that so much for us. Oh my gosh. But in addition to loving this so much, I have to know, where can we find out more about your team and any future projects that you all work on? Yeah, so you can first go to our website, um, Button City Game. You can find out all about Button City. Um, and our team's website is Subliminal Gaming. 
Uh, and then we obviously we have a Discord that you can find on the Button City um, website. That's like the best place to kind of see what we're up to, get involved in the community. The Discord is really cute. <laughs> Yeah, you all very frequently discuss things with your community members inside of the Discord, I notice, and you all are very, very active, which I love to see. Now, I'll be very honest with you, to be very, very frank right now, Shadeen, this was my absolute favorite game of the entire conference that I had an opportunity to play. And I just want to say, you all did a fantastic job with this project. As someone who plays video games professionally, this really hit me right here in that sweet spot. And I want to just say thank you so much for creating a game like this that can be that missing link between different generations of gamers. Oh, that's wonderful. That warms my heart. I'm so happy. <laughs> and I'm so happy to be interviewing you today. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for yet another interview. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to feed my Tamagotchi. Don't go anywhere, though. We have so many more development interviews and conference conversations this game does of color. Now, if I remember, I think it was up, down, left, right, left, right, start. Or was it B? Shoot.